I'm Neil Wood for Kit Guru, and this is my reaction video to the launch of Threadripper 3990X, which is happening in about 20 minutes' time as it happens, but by the time you see this video, it will have happened a few hours ago. So here's my reaction to the new 64 core Threadripper as reviewed by Luke. And truth be told, I knew that was going to be my reaction since we well we discussed this at CES, and Luke was absolutely excited beyond all measure at CES, even though at that stage we didn't know for certain that Kit Guru would be getting this CPU for review. Uh, but it's just a monster. It's just absolutely fantastic, and other hyperbolic and whatever words of praise. The thing is that when Luke reviewed the 24 core and 32 core versions of Threadripper 3000, he was blown away. They were just so much better than the second gen ones, the WXs, the big uh, WXs, uh, which weren't that great. The 12 and 16 core second gens were good, 24 core, 32 core, they were good in parts, but they had problems. The Ryzen 3000 Threadrippers, on the other hand, absolutely mind-boggling. So 24 core, 32 core, hurrah this time. Prices, yeah, they've gone up a bit. And then we've got the 64 core, priced humorously at 39.90, when I'd originally speculated it might be $5,000, maybe even seven grand. But no, 39.90 it is. And it has stormed Luke's charts. But essentially, Cinebench is out of this world. Now, Cinebench may not mean a massive amount when all said and done, but it looks good on paper. And the, the new Threadripper is just mind boggling. We knew the details about the new Threadripper a while ago. It was announced along with the 24 core, 32 core. It was at CES that Robert Halleck told us, Luke and myself, the 48 core is not a thing. So the 64 core is the next step. That's now happened. The Threadripper picture is complete for the time being. For me, Luke's review has one really interesting uh, avenue. Uh, I mean, it's all interesting, but one particularly interesting avenue, and that is power, uh, performance, heat, PBO, precision boost overdrive. This is something that I came across when I was doing the desktop Ryzen 2000 launch uh, 2700X, which was very good. But both the Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 5, my conclusion was don't bother overclocking, just let the thing work because the algorithm works well. With Ryzen 3000, AMD has improved things, really good stuff. They've also improved the technology. I believe I'm right in saying that Luke's view of the Threadripper 3000s is manual overclocking, there's no need. What you do is you go in the BIOS, you unlock PBO, you say have more power, and the system sorts itself out. Now here's the thing, the new Threadripper has the same 280 watt TDP as the uh, two current models, so 24 core, 32 core, 64 core, they're all 280 watts. You can do the maths. If you double the core count, you ain't going to get the same clock speeds for the same power. That's not going to happen. Luke's somewhat cavalier approach to PBO is to go into the BIOS, punch in the magic numbers that give it a thousand watt, thousand amp power limit, i.e. no limit whatsoever. That is, the sky is the limit. And let's let the system get on with it and see what it can do. Uh, and the system takes off and flies, but then you rapidly hit the limits of the cooler and the system settles down. You see what the clock speed is doing. You see if you get sustained performance or not. With the small thread rippers, the 24 core, 32 core, 400 watts, say, for a CPU is a lot. With the 64 core, you're going up to 600 watts, maybe even more than that. He was seeing system power draw, bear in mind the graphics are doing next to nothing, of 900 watts which is just mind boggling. So we're talking extreme in every respect. The interesting thing was this, maximum boost of this CPU 4.3 gigahertz. However, all core operating speed is down around three gigahertz. So you've got a gulf between three gigahertz and 4.1. The question is, where does your system settle down in that range? And Luke was finding that with the Wraith Ripper cooler, which is a big beastie of a cooler, he was getting 3.5 gigahertz. So you go, fair enough. Instead of base of three, uh, you can bump it, oh, sorry, operating speed of three. With PBA, you can go up to 3.5, but that is at 95 degrees. The CPU is settling at 95. It's now thermally limited, and it's going to operate at that speed. You have to ask yourself, are you happy with 95 degrees? And, and you go from there. You pick a speed. My guess is going to be you then say, no, let's pull it back on the power. Uh, dial in a limit of 400, 450 watts and settle for 3.4, 3.3 gigahertz. But Luke had another trick in the bag, and this is especially exciting. He used the Ice Giant Pro Siphon Elite 
This is a really big prototype air cooler or so. It, well, it, well, it is an air cooler, but it's so much more than that. Instead of having uh, heat pipes where the uh, boiled fluid goes up the heat pipe and then it has to condense and come back down again, in this system it goes around and around. You might recall we've covered uh, similar technology in the past from Calios. This cooler looks frankly crude. It's the 2019 prototype that Luke was working with, the same prototype, I don't know if it's the identical unit, but the same type of prototype that uh, appeared on uh, Linus Tech. Uh, shortly before CES and that video was very interesting the one that Linus did so I got in touch with the company before we went to CES and they said yep we're going to be at CES we're not exhibiting um, we can arrange to meet though so we met them shortly before the end of the show had a conversation at some ungodly early hour of the morning and they knew their stuff absolutely no doubt about it it was a very pleasing conversation and Luke was talking to their senior uh, lady who's a doctor I think of uh, thermal engineering so Luke got a sample of the ProSiphon Elite in time for this launch review and that was good because the difference it made to the performance of Threadripper 3990X was mind-blowing where the Wraith Ripper was capping out at 3.5 gigahertz 95 degrees Celsius he was now pushing on to 3.8 gigahertz and less than 95 Celsius in other words he was hitting the limits of the CPU rather than the limit of the cooler so we know far more about Threadripper than we might otherwise know. Very interesting to see, well worth a watch. Since Ice Giant has released the 2019 prototype of the ProSiphon Elite for a very limited testing, they've, they've got very few units out and about. They've come up with the 2020 prototype, which is more refined in appearance and it's much smaller in size. So Luke is keen as mustard to get his mitts on that later prototype and to really give it a good test. It does raise an interesting question of what Ice Giant is gonna do with ProSiphon Elite. Clearly there's a market in the very high-end workstation, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, th this cooler is, is going to be brilliant for Threadrippers, no doubt about that. The question is, who else might need it? Do you need such a phenomenal cooler on your tiddly little desktop with your you know, 200 watts of processor? When I say 200 watts, I mean your nominal 95 watts, but you know what I mean. So that's a different question entirely. Nonetheless, uh, this cooler has uh, really added some spice to Luke's review of the new Threadripper. It worked brilliantly well, far better than I'd have ever hoped when I first saw pictures of that first prototype. Absolutely superb. I mentioned CES and as I said, uh, towards the end of the show we met the Ice Giant people and that was very, very good news indeed. CS itself though is it a really strange show there was interesting stuff to see we did a lot of videos myself and Luke and we saw good stuff but the gaping hole was no CPUs uh, we saw a couple of laptops that were waiting for Intel 10th gen laptop CPUs which was very strange to see AMD announced uh, Ryzen 4000 for laptops and we saw in particular the Zeus ROG Zephyrus G14 but um, these laptops haven't yet launched they're announced it's all going to be happening in the very near future I think Robert Halleck was talking about February March April well we're into February now uh, so that's obviously Q1's going over into Q2 the early part of the year and it's a, it's a strange time of year anyway but I'm expecting we're going to see products actually hitting the shelves quite soon and if AMD can deliver Ryzen 4000 laptops that are interesting, that perform well, that cost a sensible amount of money and have decent battery life, then at the moment, I mean, Intel hasn't turned up to join the game. So uh, AMD's got a real chance to actually sell some laptops, which would be different. What did we see at CES? We saw some cooling hardware. We saw cases. We saw some interesting monitors. We saw some impressive monitors. We saw a bit more of this four creators thing going on. And then AMD announced Ryzen 4000 for mobile. However, at CES, Intel was effectively missing in action. Uh, we saw talk about Ice Lake. We were shown Ice Lake laptops that were impressive enough. We were surprised to see in the keynote that they did. I mean, we, we weren't there for it. It was a uh, broadcast or you know, webcast. So there's no need for us to be there. We were doing other things. The news guys back at base sat up in their pajamas and watched it. And they showed off, among other things, very briefly, their DG1, which is um, a desktop graphics one. It's uh, a development thing. Essentially, as we understand it, it's a laptop uh, graphics uh, GPU 
basically putting a PCI Express card so that games developers can actually have a play with it, plug it into their systems. And the very brief piece of gameplay that was shown was deeply unimpressive. I mean, it worked, but that's about all you could say. However, in fairness to Intel, it was never intended to be a product. The hype around Intel Odyssey was nothing more than that, just pure hype. And the question is, when will they come up with DG2, which is supposed to be a proper graphics product? And at the moment, it's 2022, which considering Raj Kadori now joined uh, Intel a couple of years ago, 2022 seemed to be long enough to actually develop a product and take it out to production. One fascinating piece of gossip recently that Adored TV had, he's, he, he clearly has some very good contacts in Intel, is that Raj is going to be using TSMC to fab Intel's graphics chips which is such a phenomenal break with uh, Intel's uh, historic use of their own fabs as to be like quite mind-boggling. However, it makes perfect sense when you consider Intel's current problems with hardware. Uh, a few years ago, if you'd said Intel's going to do a graphics card fabbed by TSMC, immediate response would be, well, that can't be right. Now it's, yeah, okay, makes perfect sense. So the world is slowly changing. We saw at least two laptops, I think one from Acer and one from MSI that were basically labelled as this is a new laptop, we're waiting for an Intel processor to put inside it. We were given absolutely no clue when 45 watt uh, laptop parts are going to arrive that are nominally 10th gen, i.e. we assume Comet Lake. We don't think it's going to be a 45 watt Ice Lake part. If there is, then Intel's keeping that very much under their hat. So at some stage, 45 watt laptop parts for gaming laptops as to when not sure i i'm assuming computex but i'm hoping before that uh the question is going to be whether they do desktop before uh laptop or laptop before desktop and right now everything is just opaque in the past the uh, push has been on mobile because that's where the sales are that's where the money is so if we go with that March or April possibly I mean after all those laptop chassis exist and they don't produce those and show those well I've never actually seen a laptop chassis produced in advance of the processor and shown off so that definitely suggests soon when it comes to Intel desktop processors all the rumors at the moment are there'll be a new chipset so presumably Z490 what that will bring over Z390 not a blooming clue there's no hint at the moment of PCI Express Gen 4 so perhaps it'll be Thunderbolt or something like that maybe it'll just be compatibility with the new processor family let's say that desktop 10th gen is going to use Comet Lake and let's say it's 14 nanometer either plus plus or plus 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 Let's say that Intel manages to cram 10 cores inside this processor that used to be four, went to six, is currently eight. Let's say they can get 10 cores in there. Goodness knows how, but let's assume they can. Let's assume the thing doesn't cook itself immediately and they bump up TDP to start taking some sort of account of the fact it's nowhere near 95 watts anymore, not at any speed you want to use. Let's assume it can clock at a reasonable pace uh, because after all the 5 gigahertz thing is what Intel's been shooting for for some while now. Let's assume all these things. Let's assume the pricing is reasonable and that's a big assumption considering Intel's currently selling every processor it can make and when the i9-9700K launched it was more like £600 than £500. Let's assume then that the, what would it be, Core i9-10-9900K? I don't know. I, I give up their model codes. But whatever they call the thing, let's assume it's got all those good points. So let's assume it's a 5 gigahertz, 10 core, nominally 125, 140 watt part that actually sucks 200 to 250 watts. Let's assume all these things and you need a new chipset. I mean, fair enough. In one respect, that's not bad. In another respect, they're so far behind AMD at the moment on the desktop, it's just terrible and absolutely grim. So when might we see this 10 series Comet Lake? Uh, Computex is the obvious time. Uh, now, if you recall, when AMD did the X570, we saw X570 motherboards before we saw Ryzen 3000. We saw Computex a year back, we saw loads of motherboards, nothing running because we had no processors. And I think the vendors have been told not to put a previous gen processor in. I think I'm right in saying that. So let us say that Intel does something similar. Let's say that for Computex, 
specs, uh, which is I think the last week of May this year, let's say they are showing off Z490 and we see a whole swathe of Z490 motherboards. And let's say the E3, which if my diary is correct, is two weeks after in Los Angeles. Let's say that we see 10th gen desktop parts there. That'd be nice. And then we know where we're going. Uh, Intel kind of has something that it can market and sell and that should be able to play games nicely. I don't think AMD is going to do anything with Ryzen 4000 desktop this year. The original roadmaps kind of suggest that it suggested 3000 last year, 4000 this year, which would have been amazingly swift. Uh, but they've got so many other things going on at AMD at the moment that to change the desktop again would be shocking actually it would be shocking it wouldn't just be surprising which thought the original roadmaps were it would be shocking because at the moment they've got such a good stack of products it's like mobile is where they need to be focusing at the moment and consoles are coming and so on and so forth the idea they're going to monkey around with the uh, ryzen 4000 on the desktop i mean it's possible but god that would be bold uh, so even if intel can come back with 10th gen comet lake on the desktop i cannot see it. it's going to be significant it'll save some embarrassment for Intel but it's it's not going to make the blindest bit of difference to Ryzen 3000 in my opinion he says up front having seen nothing to do with the actual hardware but that's my, that's what I think the big question for me at the moment is is Computex going to be affected by coronavirus I mean right now here we are in February and the news is looking bad about this virus obviously it's centered in China clearly the links between China and Taiwan are very close I mean certainly geographically even if not in spirit so what's going to happen? No idea. Right now we're being told that Computex is going ahead in the regular way with no changes. Um, we'll have to see how that goes. If this, uh, if this virus tails off, then obviously great. If on the other hand it persists or even gets worse, honestly don't know. So we'll have to see about that. If we do go there, I can see it now. Everyone's going to be walking around you know, using hand sanitizer constantly. Um, I'll probably be working in latex gloves, frankly. The idea of going around all these keyboards and cases and things that everyone else has been touching and then doing video and so on, it's not a good thought. Um, so that might be a bit peculiar. I'm pinning a lot of hope on Computex this year. I am expecting Intel to deliver. I'm certain AMD is going to be delivering laptops galore. I don't know what Nvidia is going to be doing. Uh, there are rumours sloshing around, but right now they seem to be stretching out further into the future. So it's going to be a busy show, provided it goes ahead. CES was interesting, but there was nothing earth-shaking. The, the sort of further details about the new Threadripper, that was interesting stuff, but it's the launch today that's the big thing. Threadripper with 64 cores is here, and you can go out and buy it for, frankly, a reasonable amount of money. You'll need to watch Luke's review to find out why on earth you might even consider having such a process uh, in your own personal PC workstation. But there are legitimate use cases. I have to say Luke is deadly excited about the new Threadripper and it's rubbed off on me. I too. I was meh and now I really can barely believe what AMD has managed to produce. Deeply impressive work. Threadripper 3990X, it's here and it just absolutely rocks. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit the bell button, subscribe, head over to Teespring and buy some Kit Guru merch. I'm Leo Wood for Kit Guru. This is my reaction to an awful lot of things.